버니큐가 영어 원서 읽기 500번 읽기 도전 일곱 번째 읽기 버니큘라 입니다. 어, 오늘은 섀도우 리딩 없이 그냥 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. Editor's note The book you are about to read was brought to my attention in a most unusual way. One Friday afternoon, just before closing time, I heard a scratching sound at the front door of my office. When I opened the door, there before me stood a sad-eyed, droopy-eared dog carried a large, plain envelope in his mouth. He dropped it at my feet, gave me a soulful glance, and with a great, quiet dignity, sauntered away. Inside the envelope was the manuscript of the book you now hold in your hand together with this letter. Gentlemen, the enclosed story is true. It happened in this very town to me and the family with whom I reside. I have changed the names of the family in order to protect them. But in all other respects, everything you will read here is factual. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Harold. I come to write I came to writing purely by chance. My full time occupation is dog. I live with Mr. and Mrs. X, called here the Monroes. And their two sons, Toby is the eight and Pete is the ten. Also sharing our home is a cat named Chester, whom I am pleased to call my friend. We were a typical American family, and still are, though the, though the events related in my story have, of course, had their effect on their li our lives. I hope you will find this tale of sufficient interest to yourself and your readers to warrant its publication. Sincerely, Harold X. Chapter 1. The Arrival I shall never forget the first time I laid this now tired old eyes on our visitor. I had been left at home by the family with the admonition to take care of the house so until they returned. That's something they always say to me when they go out. Take care of the house, Harold. You are the watchdog. I think it's their way of making up for not taking me with them, as if I wanted to go anyway. You can't lie down at the movies and see the secret screen, and the people think you are being impolite if you fall asleep and start to snore, or sketch yourself in public. No, thank you. I'd rather be stretched out on my favorite rug in front of a nice, whistling radiator. But I digress. I was talking about that first night. Well, it was cold. The rain was patting the windows, the wind was howling, and it felt pretty good to be indoors. I was lying on the rug with my head on my paws, just staring absently at the front door. My friend Chester was curled up on the brown velvet armchair, which years ago he had taken out as his own. I saw that once again he had covered the whole seat with his cat hair, and I chuckled to myself, picturing the scene tomorrow. Next to grasshoppers, there is nothing that frightens. There is nothing that frightens Chester more than the vacuum cleaner. In the midst of a this reverie, I heard the car pull into the driveway. I didn't even bother to get up and see who it was. I knew it had to be my family, the Monos, since it was just about time for the movie to be over. After a moment, the front door flew open. There they stood in the doorway. Toby and Pete and Mom and Dad Monroe. There was a flash of lightning, and in its glare, I noticed that Mr. Monroe was carrying a little bundle, a bundle with tiny glistening eyes. Pete and Toby bounded into the room, both talking at the top of their rooms. Toby shouted, "Put him over here, Dad! Take your boots off! You are soaking wet!" replied his mother. Somehow, someone caught me, I thought, under the circumstances. But mom, what about... First, first, stop dripping on the carpet. Would somebody like to take this? Asked Mr. Munro, indicating the bundle with the eyes. I'd like to remove my coat. I will, Pete yelled. No, I will, said Toby. I found him. You will drop him. I will not. You will too. Mom, Pete punched me. I'll take him, said Mrs. Monroe. Take off your coat, take off your coat this minute. But she became so involved in helping the boys out of their coat 
that she didn't take him at all. My tranquil evening had been destroyed, and no one had even said hello to me. I wimpled to remind them that I was there. Harold cried to Toby, Guess what happened to me? And then, all over again, everyone started talking at once. At this point, I feel I must explain something. In our family, everyone, everyone treats everyone else with a great respect for his or her intelligence. They're good for the animals as well as the people. Everything that happens to them is explained to us. It's never been just a good boy, Harold, or use the little box, Chester, at our house. Oh no, with us it's, hey Harold, that got raised and now we are, uh, we are in a higher tax bracket. Or come, sit on, sit on the bed, Chester, and watch this World Kingdom show. Maybe you will see a relative, which shows just how thoughtful they are. But after all, Mr. Morno is a college professor, and Mrs. Morno is a lawyer. So we think of we think of it as a rather special household, and we are therefore rather special pets. So it wasn't at all surprising to me that they took the time to explain the strange circumstances surrounding the arrival of the little bundle with the glistening eyes now among us. It seems that they had arrived at the theater later, and rather than trip over the fate of the audience already seated. They decided to sit in the last row, which was empty. They tiptoed in and sat down very quietly, so they wouldn't disturb anyone. Suddenly, Toby, who's the little one, sprang up from his chair and squealed that he said he had sat on something. Mr. Morno told him to stop making a fuss and move to another seat. But in an unusual display of independence, Toby said he wanted to see just what it was he had set on. An usher came over to their row to shush them, and Mr. Murnau borrowed his flashlight. What they found on Toby's chair was the little blanket bundle that was now sitting on Mr. Murnau's lap. They now unwrapped the blanket, and the deal in the center was a tiny black and white rabbit, sitting in a shoe box filled with dirt. A piece of paper had been tied to his neck with a ribbon. There were words on the paper, but the mourners were unable to decipher them because they were in a totally unfam unfamiliar language. I moved closer for a better look. Now, most people might call me a mongrel, but I have some pretty fancy blood around learning through these veins, and the Russian wolfhound happens to be one of them. Because my family get around a lot, I was able to recognize the language as an obscure dialect of the Carpathian mountain region. Roughly translated, it read, Take good care of my baby. But I couldn't tell if it was a note from a believed mother or a piece of a Romanian shit music. A little guy was shivering from fear and cold. It was decided that Mr. Monroe and the boys would make a house for him out of an old crate and some heavy-duty wire mesh from the garage. For the night, the boys would make a bed for him in a shoebox. Toby and Pete ran outside to find the crate, and Mrs. Monroe went to the kitchen to get him some milk and lettuce. lettuce. Mr. Monroe sat down, a dazed expression in his eyes as if he were wondering how he came to be sitting in his own living room in a wet raincoat with a strange bunny on his lap. I signaled to Chatter, and the, and the two of us casually moseyed over to a corner of the room. We looked at each other. Well, what do you think? I asked. I don't think rabbits like milk, he answered. Chatter and I were unable to continue our conversation because a deafening crash commanded our attention. Pete yelled from the hallway, Ma, Toby broke the rabbit's house. I didn't, I just dropped it. Pete won't let me carry it. It's too big, Toby is too little. I'm not, you're too. Okay, fellas, Mrs. Murnau called out as she entered with the milk and lettuce. Let's try to get in here with as little hot hysteria as possible, please. Chatter turned to me and said under his breath, That lettuce looks repulsive. But if there's any milk left, I get it. 
I certainly wasn't going to argue with him. I'm a waterman myself. At that moment, the crater arrived, barely standing the strain of being pulled in two directions at once. Ma Toby said he's going to keep the rabbit in his room. That's not, that's not fair. Harold sleeps in his room. Only sometimes, I thought, but I know he's got a leftover ham sandwich in his drawer. Dobby's a nice kid, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't hurt that he shared his stage with, stage with me. It was, after all, at one of those last night parties, uh, late, night, late night parties in Toby's room that I first developed my taste for chocolate cake. And Toby, not in my preference, has kept me in chocolate cake ever since. Pete, on the other hand, doesn't believe in sharing. And the only time I tried to sleep on his bed, he rolled over on me and pinned me by my ears so that I couldn't move for the rest of the night. I had a crick in my neck for days. But he's mine, Toby said. I found him. You sat on him, you mean? I found him and he's sleeping in my room. You can keep smelly old Harold in your room and Chester too, if you want to. But I'm gonna keep the rabbit in mine. Smelly old Harold, I would have bitten his ankle, but I knew he hadn't changed his sock for a week. Smelly, indeed. Mr. Morno spoke up. I think the best place for the rabbit is right here in the living room, on that table by the window. It's right there, and he will get lots of fresh air. Peter's taller than I am, Toby cried. He will be able to see the rabbit better. Too bad, squirk. Okay, said Mrs. Morneau through clenched the teeth. Let's put him to bed and make him comfortable. And then we can all get some sleep. Why? Peter asked. I don't want to I, I don't want to go to sleep. Mrs. Morneau smiled a little too sweetly at Pete. Look, Ma, said Toby. He's not drinking his milk. Chester nudged me in the ribs. Did I tell you? he asked. Excuse me, why I make myself available? Hey, said Toby, we gotta name him. Can't that wait until tomorrow? asked Mr. Morneau. The boys shouted in unison. No, he has to have a name right now. I have to say I agreed with them. It took them three days to name me, and those were the three most anxious days of my life. I couldn't sleep at all, worrying that they were really gonna... They, they were really gonna call me floppy as Mrs. Morneau had suggested. Well, all right, sighed Mrs. Morneau. What about, uh, say, Bun Bun? Uh-oh, there she goes again, I thought. Where did she get them? Yuck, we all said. Well then, how about Floppy? She offered, hopefully. Pete looked at his mother and smiled. You never give up, do you, Ma? Meanwhile, Chester, who had also been named Floppy for a short time, was rubbing against Mrs. Morneau's ankles and purring, purring loudly. No, Chester, not now, she said, pushing him aside. He wants to help us name him, don't you, Chester? Toby asked, as he scooped him up into his arms. Chester shot me a look. I could tell this was not what he had in mind. Come on, Harold, Toby called. You've got to help with the name, too. I joined the family. And the serious thinking began. We all peeled into the box. It was the first time I had really seen him. So this is a rabbit, I thought. He sort of looks like a Chester, only he's got longer ears and a shorter tail. Longer ears and a shorter tail, and a motor in his nose. Well, it said Pete, after a moment, since we found him at the movies. Why don't we call you Mr. Johnson? There was a moment of silence. Who's Mr. Johnson? asked Toby. The guy who owns the movie theater. Pete answered. No one seemed to like the idea. How about Prince? said Mr. Monroe. Dad, said Toby. Are you kidding? Well, I had a dog named the Prince once, he replied lamely. Prince, I thought that's a silly name for a dog. We found him at a Dracula movie. Let's call him Dracula, Toby said. That's a stupid name, said Pete. 
No, it's not. And anyway, I found him, so I should get to name him. Mom, you're gonna get, you're gonna let him name him, are you? That's favoritism, and I'll be traumatized if you do. Mrs. Marno looked in wonder at Pete. Please, Mom, please, Dad, let's name him Dracula, cried the Toby. Please, please, please. And with his please, he squeezed the chatter a little harder. Harder. Mrs. Marno picked up the bowl of milk and moved toward the kitchen. Chatter followed her every movement with his eyes, which now seemed to be popping out of his head. When she reached the kitchen door, she turned back and said, Let's not have any more arguments. We'll compromise. He's a, bu he's a bunny, and we found him at a Dracula movie. So, we will call him Bunny Killer. Bunny Killer. That should make everybody happy, including me. Including me? What about me? Murdered the chatter. I won't be happy until she puts down the milk. Well, guys, is that okay with you? As she asked. Toby and Pete looked at one another, and then at the rabbit, a smile grew on Toby's face. Yeah, Ma, I think that name is just right. Pete shrugged. It's okay, but I get to fit in. Okay, I'm gonna put the milk back in the fridge. Maybe he will drink it tomorrow. What about Chester? Toby said, dropping the frantic cat to the floor. Maybe he would like it. Chester made a beeline for Mrs. Murno and looked up at her, playing tibbly. Oh, Chester, doesn't want any more milk, do you, Chester? You've already had your milk today. She reached down, patted Chester on his head, and walked into the kitchen. Chester didn't move. Okay, bad time, said Mr. Monroe. Good night, Bunnicula, Toby said. Good night, Count Bunnicula, Pete said sarcastically. And what I took be, what I took to be his attempt at a Transylvanian accent. I may be wrong, but I thought I saw a flicker of movement from the cage. Good night, Harold. Good night, Chester. I lit the Toby good night. Good night, smelly Harold. Good night, Don Chester. I drew it on Peter's foot. Mom, Harold drew it on my foot. Good night, Pete, Mrs. Morno said with great finality as she came back into the living room. And then more calmly, good night, Harold, good night, Chester. Mr. and Mrs. Morneau went up the stairs together. You know, dear, Mr. Morneau said, that was very clever, Bonicula. I could never have thought of a name like that. Oh, I don't know, Robert. She smiled as she put her arm through his. I think Prince is a lovely name, too. The room was quiet. Chester was still sitting by the closed kitchen door in a state of shock. Slowly, he turned to me. I wish they had named him Fluffy, was all he said. Chapter 2 Music in the Night I feel at this time there are, there are a few things you should know about Chester. He is not your ordinary cat, but then I'm not your ordinary dog. Since an ordinary dog wouldn't be writing this book, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Murnau, along with two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, hence the name Chester, and a first edition of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. As a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Murnau is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of, taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingston Seeger particularly delicious. From Chester's kittenhood, from Chester's kittenhood on, Mr. Murnau has used him as a sounding board for all all his students' lectures. If Chester doesn't fall asleep when Mr. Murnau is talking, a lecture can be counted a success. Every night, when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and calls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and the tales of horror and the supernatural. As a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. 
I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background before I relate to you the story of the event following the arrival of Bonicula into our home. Let me begin with that first night. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester still stewing over the lost milk. Settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since as you know, cats can see in the dark. A shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind, set, wind, and, the wind and rain had stopped. And as Chester read Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply as if gathering, as if gathering sustenance from the moonlight. Sustenance from the moonlight. He slicked his eels back close to his body and for the first time, Chatter said, I noticed the peculiar marking on his forehead. What had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears took a strange V-shape, which connected with a big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat. No, more likely, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence had drifted the strains of a remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it was a gypsy violin, Chester told me. I thought perhaps a cabin was passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my mother telling me something about cabins when I was a puppy, but for the life of me, I couldn't remember what. What's a cabin? I asked, feeling a little stupid. A cabin is a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons, Chester answered. Ah, oh, yes, it was coming back to me now. Station wagons? No, covered wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting, setting up camps around great bonfires, doing magical tricks, and sometimes, if you cross their farms with a piece of silver, silver they, will tell your, they will tell your future. Fortune. They will tell your fortune. You mean? You mean? If I gave them a fork, they'd tell me my fortune? I asked bristlessly. Chetel looked at me with a disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a cabin after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chetel explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Michael White, our next door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. He listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with relief. I've really got to stop reading this horror story is a last late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bunny his eyes intense and staring, and unearthly aura about them. Now this is the part you won't believe, Chester said to me. But as I watched, his lips parted in a hideous smile, and where rabbit's bucket teeth should have been, two little pointed fangs glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, it set my hair on end. Chapter 3 Some Unusual Goings On The next few days passed uneventfully. I was very bored. Our new arrival, 
slept all day, and the Chester, whose curiosity has been aroused by the strange behavior of the rabbit that first night, had decided to stay awake every night to observe him. Therefore, he too spent most of his days sleeping, uh, so I, I had no one to talk to. The evenings weren't much better. Toby and Pete, who used to play with me as soon as they got home from school, now ran immediately to that silly rabbit's cage to play with him. Or, at least they tried to. But Nicola did not make the most energetic playmate. It took him quite a while to wake up each night, and then, when he did awaken, he didn't do much except hop around the living room. He didn't play catch, he didn't fetch, he didn't roll over to get his tummy rubbed. I couldn't understand why they played with him at all. I expect it was because he was new and different, but I was confident that they would soon tire of him and come back to trusty old Harold. Finally, on the morning of the fourth day, fourth day I caught Chester bleary-eyed over the water dish. He grumbled at me in a most unpleasant manner. You know, Chester, you were never exactly charming in the morning. But lately, you've become, you've become downright grumpy," Chester growled in, a, in response. In response, what are you doing this for anyway? What are you looking for? He's just a cute little bunny. Cute little bunny. Chester was amazed at my character analysis. That's what you think. He's a danger to this household and everyone in it. Oh, Chester, I said with an indulgent smile. I think your reading has gone to I think your reading has gone to your head. It's just because I do read that I know what I'm talking about. Well, what are you talking about? I still don't understand. I'm not sure yet, but I know there's just something funny about the rabbit. That's why I have to keep a rot. But look at you, you are exhausted. You sleep all the you sleep all the time. How can you call how can you call that a rot? I'm awake when it's important. He sleeps all day, so I sleep all day. So just what have you been since the since that first night that makes you uneasy? Well, said Chester, I uh, that is at this point Chester started to bathe, bathe. His, ta his tail, which is a cat's way of changing, uh, changing a subject he finds uncomfortable. He then stumbled sleepily into, into the living room. So I asked again, following him, what have, you be what have you seen? Nothing, he snapped, and proceeded to cut up on his chair to go to sleep. After a moment, he opened, he opened one eye, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to see. For the next few mornings, it was the same routine. I'd be ready for a good romp around the living room, and Chester would go to sleep. Pete and Toby were at school. Mr. Monlo was at the university. He never did too much romping around anyway, and Mrs. Monlo was at her office. No one to play with the poor, neglected Harold. At first, I thought I could strike up a friendship with Bonicula and maybe teach him a few tricks 